The scripture reading this morning comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Certainly appreciate your presence here this morning. We have a number of visitors, and we're so thankful that you're here. We have some special visitors to me and Robin and, uh, and Brittany, and the fact that we have some friends from North Carolina that have come their way. They told us they were on their way to Colorado, and they were making a detour. I don't know how that can be, but we're glad they're here. Uh, some very faithful friends of ours, and we're just delighted that they've come our way. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll stay around for a little while. Uh, after worship, there's going to be a lunch prepared. We're going to celebrate uh, uh, the Bennetts as they are about to embark on a new journey, and uh, they are at the Crockett Congregation this morning, and uh, it's there that Caleb is preaching, and uh, certainly he'll have more to say about that later on today, perhaps. But again, we are glad that you're here. The passage that was read for you a moment ago, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, a lot of times it's quoted or read during a youth devotional. A lot of times if there's a youth day, that entire theme may be centered uh, upon that very verse. But at the same time, it's not really geared toward the youth necessarily. If you'll remember, as Solomon is writing the book of Ecclesiastes, he's actually reflecting back upon all the places that he had searched for happiness. In chapter 1, he, he even looks at the fact that, that he could find happiness through his own wisdom. And in chapter 2, he looks for things like wealth and, and just the pleasures of life, and somehow that that will certainly make him happy. By the time you get to chapter 4, that he is, he's looking at power, being the, the king of Israel, that somehow that's going to make him happy. But all the while, as you go through the book, you begin to see that he has spent his entire life in vanity. And a life that's basically empty. Uh, did he have a lot of pleasures in life? Yes, but kind of the will of God. And so by the time you get to chapter 12, he's telling not only the generation behind him, but he's telling all the readers of this book to remember wherever you are right now. And the idea is that there are days ahead that you want to live in those days without any regret. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul really kind of approached the young preacher Timothy in the same way in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse number 12. He says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example to the believers in word, in conversation, in charity. Impurity. He wanted him to go about his daily business. If you go by and just do those things which God would have you to do, God's going to bless you for it. I grew up in a household where my father had the same, it seemed like it was the same saying all the time. And I, I regret the fact that I didn't listen to him or pay attention to this more as a young man, but he would say, you do what's good and what's right, and God will bless you for it. That's all Solomon is saying here. Uh, but there's really even more if you stop and think about it. Because everything that centers around an individual desiring to be happy, uh, to, to accomplish those things that God would have him to accomplish, it, it's really about his character. It's about building up the person that God wants us to be. And 
again, back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, when you come back to verse 12 and you begin to see Solomon putting all of these things together. Yes, I spent years in vanity, but yes, I, I have a come to a place in my life where I can reflect back and I don't want to regret those things and I don't want you to either. So this is what he says. He says, and further by these, my son, be admonished, and making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh, but let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The King James translators have added that word duty there. It's not in the original text. It's there for emphasis, but actually it might take away the emphasis because he's saying, for this is the whole of man. This is his entirety. It's to fear God and to keep his commandments. Think about an individual who lives by such a way. Think about the influence in which he will have. Think about those individuals to which he will draw in. Think about the life that could actually spend or be spent with a smile rather than misery. With hope rather than hopelessness. A life that can actually be spent looking forward to something rather than regretting our past. This morning, while time will allow, I want us to look at this idea of building character. And there's really three foundations to it, or three building blocks, if you want to say it that way. And I, I want you to understand that as we approach each one of these things, that just because I'm standing before you this morning, I don't want anyone to ever think that somehow I have mastered these things because there's a lot of this that I'm still striving for. I'm sure that uh, many of you, if not all of you, are striving for the same thing because number one, you love God. Number two, you want to live in accordance to His will. But thirdly, you want to help others find Him as well. So let's look at these three building blocks, if you will. The first is probably the hardest. And you will hear the word, you may not think that, but it, but it truly might be. The first building block to character is honesty. The first building block to character is honesty. This is an attribute that we are to develop in our lives, to develop our character, and God expects us to do that. You remember when when Jesus was giving the parable of the sower, that he went out and he, he would broadcast that seed and it would fall on different types of ground. But he talked about the seed that fell upon the good ground. And there was honesty attached to that because it actually represented a heart that would receive the things in which God would say, that would receive the seed, the word of God, and that it would begin to produce and to grow fruit. But what, watch what Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 15. He says, But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bringeth forth fruit and patience. <clears throat> Honesty begins with actually receiving the Word of God. The only way that the Word of God can be received is with an open heart, and not an open uh, door of emotions, but rather an open mind to be able to reason from the Scriptures those things that are good and right according to the standard of God. But notice this, even in Romans chapter 12 and verse 17 where Paul gives the actual warning about developing this character of honesty. 
that he says this is how it will act. He says, recompense no man evil for evil, provide, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Again, Romans 12 and verse 17. Well, Paul understood that those individuals at Rome and their backgrounds and even the persecution that would come upon them, that they would still stay on the straight and narrow pathway looking for the opportunity to display their honesty. I told you about a young man in, in China that, that the national security had come and they had apprehended him and, and held him for a period of time and searched all of his devices and wanted to know all of his communications and all of these things. And, and, and they told him that he cannot be meeting with these Christians any longer, although they were meeting underground. And I, I guess they got spotted or they got turned in, whatever it may be. And he was asked what he was going to do. And he says, we're just going to move to another place and we're going to keep meeting. Not that he was trying to defy anyone. He was only trying to be honest with God. And to be honest to the people that he's trying to reach. Honesty may be one of the biggest obstacles, again, that you and I will ever cross. Open your Bibles, if you will, to James, the first chapter. In James chapter 1. In James chapter 1. The inspired writer here is giving you and I, the readers, as he was in the first century, those readers there, the opportunity to look at ourselves and, and who we actually are. But he says this, beginning in verse number 22. He says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like... Unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Now, stop right here for a second. So, he's showing some identity marks here. Hey, here's an individual that he's a hearer but are not a doer of the word, okay? A an individual who has honesty as part of the characteristics, his makeup, that he would certainly begin to look at himself. And he says not only this, but he's going to be looking with the natural face. In other words, there's, there's no hypocrisy, there's no makeup, there's nothing. He's going to be able to look into this mirror and see exactly what he's supposed to see. I've heard it told before that when you look at a picture that you see what other people see, but when you look into a mirror, you see who you actually are. You know, the, the picture that puts on the 10 pounds, the video that, that may be distorted, but you look into the looking glass, you look into the mirror, and you see who you really are. You see who you see. Uh, the looking glass here that James is speaking of is the Word of God. And so when you and I look in the Word of God, who should I be looking to see? Well, some will say Jesus, and you're right. But here's the thing. Before I can really see Jesus as He is, don't I need to see who I am? And so the idea of looking into this this looking glass, this natural face that I bring before it, what do you see? Do you see yourself the way that God sees you? The character that's built with honesty. Now watch what he continues to say after verse number 22. He says, For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. Why? Because he's dishonest. But look, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. You know, it's funny, the word blessed there 
in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is the same word that means happy. Wasn't that what Solomon was looking for? Was he looking for happiness by, with his own wisdom, with his own wealth, with his own power? But that individual who will take all of these things off and just be honest with himself and look at himself in the word of God, that that's the honesty that God wants us to see. Paul told Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that they may lead a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. What are you praying about? Certainly we pray for others, we pray for those in authority, we pray for our brethren, we pray for those individuals who are sick, and we even pray, make petitions on our own behalf. Give me this strength, give me this, give me that. How many times have we approached God with the idea, help me live a honest and pure life? We know what our weaknesses are, and if we know what our weaknesses are, God certainly knows them. And from that standpoint, honesty is that building block that will allow our character to not only allow us to draw closer to God, but it will allow us to draw closer to others that we want God to know, or we want them to know God. The second building block, from honesty, we talk about faith. Well, they'll say that's a given, and it certainly is. You want character, you must have faith. As a matter of fact, the Hebrews writer said that in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Please who? Please God. It's impossible to do that without faith. But here's the thing. Sometimes our faith is spread kind of thin, isn't it? We put our faith in a lot of things. We, 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 we want to put our faith in God, but I've got to put my faith in, in perhaps my ability to accomplish this. Or I put my faith in, in someone else in, in whom I'm depending to, to do certain things. It, it could be a family member. It can be a spouse. It can be a friend. It can be a co-worker. It can be all of these things. But our faith is going to be in something. You know, some people will make faith a pleading session in their life. Do you know what I mean by that? That, that their faith is only shown when the difficulties arise and they hit their knees and they're pleading with God for help or they're pleading with God to fix something. They're pleading with God to heal somebody. And perhaps that's the only conversation they've had with God for a while. But what kind of faith is that? It's not a faith that builds character. But we understand that the Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1, we understand how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. But what does this faith mean? What is, what is your faith? Uh, maybe the simplest answer is, it's my belief in God. Would you be right? Certainly. Absolutely right. But what does that mean? What does that mean to have this belief in God? Well, if we believe God, we'll do the things that he says to do, right? Right? Even Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, the Hebrews writer said that, that he is the author and finisher of our faith to everyone who obeys him. Uh, we understand that, that, that it takes great faith to believe in a God that we cannot see, but the idea is we obtain all of the evidence and all of them point to a creator who has given us life and sustains this life. But I think sometimes our faith in God is like 
God move this mountain? Can you just move it out of the way? If you move this out of the way, I can see more clearly. But shouldn't faith be, Father, just tell me to climb this mountain. Sometimes we look at God and we say, uh, uh, God, can you move this obstacle so I don't have to deal, it, uh, deal with it? Just, just remove it, take it out of the way. Rather than allowing our faith to be in God and say, God, just show me a way around it, show me a way through it, show me a way over it. You show me the way. Because a lot of times our faith can be so one-sided, we want God to do everything, and yet He can give us the ability to do so much. That's what real faith would be if we're going to build this character. I grew up in the Lord's church. And I remember conversations from family members, and they would talk about certain members, not in a negative way, mind you. They, they would talk about certain ones, and they would talk about how faithful that individual was. And they weren't talking uh, faithful in the sense that they were at every service. That was a given. That, that, that's just where they would be. But, but rather, no matter what happened in life, whether it was good or bad, that they would take it as an opportunity to thank God or depend upon God. That they never made a decision without God being a part of it. And that had such an influence, uh, like on people like my parents, but it had an influence hearing their stories about those individuals. I think about the people that I've known through my life who are faithful children of God. And the fact is that they don't make a move without God being considered first. But then again, that was the teaching in James chapter 4, wasn't it? Verse 14, what is your life but it's but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away? What we ought to say is that we'll go into the city, buy and sell and get gain. What we ought to say is if it be the Lord's will, this is what we'll do. That's the kind of faith that God is looking for, not only for us to draw closer to God, but that's the kind of faith that God expects us to use and to help others to grow closer to God. And finally, here's the third one, third building block. Strength. Uh, You have to have honesty, faith, strength. But oftentimes, we never truly understand the need for strength until it's gone. You ever faced a loved one dying? You ever faced a tragedy in your life? You ever lost a job? You ever wonder how you're going to keep the lights on? You ever wondered where the next meal is going to come from? Have you ever wondered if your children are doing what they ought to be doing after they've left home? You ever wonder about these things and a lot of those things were in your control at one time but but suddenly you you've lost that control you've lost that strength and and again you never knew what it meant to have it until it was gone Uh, the old testament gives us a great example of this you remember in judges chapter 16 we read of the account of samson the Nazarite who had never had a razor to his head and, 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 and the fact is as, as long as his hair was growing that he would have this great and magnificent strength and he could fight many battles and he would win them uh, not only from, from that standpoint but because of his strength that came from God. And you see that at the end of the story. In Judges chapter 16, if you'll turn over there. Yeah. 
In Judges 16, he offers this, beginning at verse number 15. And she said unto him, of course, this is Delilah, but she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thy, when thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And he came to pass when she pressed him daily with the words and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death. But now jump to verse 21. After he had told her where his strength lied, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and did grind in, and he did grind in the prison house, howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Now think about this for a second. She found out where his strength lies. She shaved, had his head shaved. He becomes weak like any other man. But then the Philistines lay their hands on him and his hair begins to grow again. He's regaining that strength. Where did it come from? Well, it came from God. As a matter of fact, that when you come down to verse number 28, all of that is on uh, uh, is in play. In verse 28, he said, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines of my two eyes. And so here he was, uh, uh, someone who was dependent upon uh, the natural hair growth, that he would depend upon the strength that it provided, and then suddenly it was taken away. He didn't realize just how weak he was without it, but then he turns to God and he says, not to let my hair grow so I can have my strength, but God strengthen me. I don't know how many people I've heard in this congregation say in times past that their favorite passage of all the scripture is Philippians 4 and verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which what? Strengthens me. Certainly. Uh, certainly we, we, we have that knowledge. But what do we have that understanding? And what I mean by that is that we know that's where our strength lies. But sometimes we're just not understanding just how weak we are without him. Do you remember in uh, the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 6, you, you know, we, we have entire gospel meetings and series and everything centered around the, the whole armor of God. You remember verse 11 all the way through the end of the chapter, it talks about all the things that the child of God is to put on. And he puts these things on simply because you have the devil with this quiver full of arrows and he's shooting these arrows, shooting arrows of temptation, obstacles, mountains, whatever it may be. But he's shooting those and we need to guard ourselves against them. But you can have all the armor in the world and it's not going to defeat the devil until you understand verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His mind. That's the only way the armor works. He said take the sword of the Spirit you can only take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, if you truly believe that there's strength in it, that God's put it, uh, put in there. The opportunities that are before you, before me, that if we do not believe that it's through the strength that God gives us that we can accomplish these things, it's no wonder we won't knock on someone's door when it's called for. It's no wonder that we won't stand in front of someone and introduce Jesus to them when it's called for. It's no wonder that we will not put ourselves in positions to win souls for Jesus when it's called for. Because we think that we're doing it with our own strength and not with the strength of God. You want to build godly character? 
There's three things you have to add to your life. You have to be honest, not only with God, but you have to be honest with yourself. You want to build that godly character, you need to have faith. Not faith that just simply, I believe that God exists, or I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but the type of belief that says that I will do what God says I ought to do. And with that kind of faith, you rely upon the strength, not your own strength. You'll never be strong enough by yourself to accomplish the things that God wants you to accomplish, but rather with His help, and the power of his mind. You and I have the opportunity, as the apostles did in Acts chapter 4, turn the world upside down. And we certainly can do that. There's nothing hindering us from that. Unless we have a lack of honesty, a lack of faith, and a lack of strength. This morning, you have the opportunity to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that's commanded, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and or 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, that you must obey the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 that know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead that we should also be raised to walk in newness of life. You and I have the opportunity to obey the gospel. That's why Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Maybe as a child of God, maybe you haven't been honest with yourself. Maybe the fact is your faith has been stricken. Maybe it's not active in the way that it should be. Perhaps... Perhaps you just haven't been as strong as you ought to be. Well, why don't you make that turn today? Make that turn today, rededicating your life to God, confessing those sin or sins that are in your life, and allow God to strengthen you by surrounding you, not only with His Word, but surrounding you with your brethren who would pray with you and for you this, this morning. If we can assist you in any way, won't you come right now as together we